Hello, I'm State Representative Jim Beakey from the 84th House District. Welcome to Ohio in Focus. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. I'm your host, Brad Miller. I'm joined today by State Representative Jim Beakey, who serves the 84th House District, which includes all of Mercer County and parts of Audley's, Dark, and Shelby counties. Representative, as always, a pleasure. Well, thank you, Brad. It's my privilege. Um, this episode, we'll be uh, talking a lot about taxes and uh, various budgets that have been going through the House. Um, we'll start with a tax quiz uh, that uh, we've talked about. Um, in the month of April now, we're uh, looking at uh, making outdoor plans with friends and families, but also um, on our minds are taxes. And uh, the state this year is uh, quizzing some people to prove uh, uh, they are who they say they are. Can you tell us uh, about these ta uh, quizzes? Sure. Well, uh, of course, this is uh, turning out to be somewhat of a controversial situation because the tax commissioner and the tax department have determined that uh, they're going to try to identify fraudulent tax filers. And so to do that, they're asking questions of tax filers to make sure that their identity is exactly that, that they, who they say they are. And so uh, there's a series of tests with five questions each. You have to pass four of the five uh, and, and so on. There's four different tests. So if you happen to not pass the first test, they got another test and so on. So, and, uh, and uh, my office is, has received many, many calls and, and communications from constituents who have been quite concerned about this. Now, the intention is very good, but uh, quite frankly, uh, uh, I would, would prefer that the tax department go after people rather than try to get them in the front door. They've, they've spent quite a bit of money uh, setting this program up and uh, so on. So. That's what's going on, and uh, hey, it's, it's the way it is, and I hope that uh, this first year that they've uh, ha had this system that uh, perhaps uh, when it's all said and done, they review it, uh, that there'll be uh, some changes made to the good. Uh, so that's basically what's going on. So I'm no math expert, but four out of five, 80 percent. If a person doesn't get 80 percent, um, have most people been able to pass it? Yes. As a matter of fact, over 90 percent of the people have passed it, but that means somewhere between five and ten percent haven't so they got to go through lots of hoops to uh, you know to answer questions and and so on and and the, the company that's that's put this all together uh, maintains that there's around hundred and fifty thousand people who uh, haven't taken the test and they're calling them fraudulence and 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 I'm I'm saying that I, I doubt that there's anywhere close to hundred and fifty thousand people that have filed fraudulent tax returns or there are people who who look at the letter and say, what's this, throw it away, or, or they don't understand, or they don't take the, t the test in the time frame that they're supposed to, or I think you get 14 days from the time you receive the notice and so on. So uh, it, it's, it's obviously a, a situation that uh, I'm hopeful will be given a lot more scrutiny in the future after the tax season is over. So you touched on the, the what's coming ahead in the future. Do you think this is something the legislature is potentially going to look at, or, or where do you see it going Well, if it, I, I would say that if the drum beats continue, there may be legislative. You understand there, there was no legislative input into this in the first place. This is a, a, a situation that developed at the tax department. Uh, we'll move on to uh, a couple of budgets, uh, budget-related topics. Um, it is budget season in the House, has mm -hmm. been for a while, and will be for a little while longer. Um, and that extends outside just the main operating budget. Sure. Um, there are two, a series of smaller budgets that uh, are lesser known. Um, two of them uh, that we'll talk about today passed the House last month, and that is uh, regarding the Bureau of Workers' Compensation and the Industrial Commission. Uh, we'll look at each of them separately. Um, you supported both budgets. We'll start with the BWC version. Sure. Um, what does that bill accomplish? What's in it? And why do you think it deserved passage? Well, of course, it's, it's the budget for the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. By the way, the budget is 4% less than the current budget it's in. The, uh, I give my hats off to Director Bureau and the, the staff at the B, BWC because they've not only managed the money well from 
and you understand the, the, the money the BWC handles is premiums from employers. And so the, in, in the last uh, few couple of years, they have refunded monies back to the employers on three different occasions, and their budget this year is less coming up. So I view that as uh, very good management, and, and while they're preserving the integrity of the system, and the, uh, the system is BWC was created in 1913 so that when uh, employees are injured on the job that they will be taken care of uh, from a health standpoint to get that injury healed so they can get back to work and go on with productive uh, employment. And so over the years, uh, BWC has had some, in my time around here, my 23 years here, there's been some very interesting issues regarding BWC, but currently uh, I believe it's run, is being run as, as well as it has been since I've been in Columbus. Uh, so moving on to the uh, Industrial Commission budget, same questions, uh, what's in it and why'd it pass? Uh, it, well, here again, of course, the Industrial Commission, as you know, is the, the entity that uh, uh, takes care of the prosecution of the fraudulent uh, cases uh, in, in BWC. There is, just like everything else, there's, there's mayhem. So uh, the Industrial Commission is in charge of that responsibility, and their, their budget is, I believe it's... Uh, eight million dollars less than the previous budget so it's being run well as it, it just like BWC they work hand in hand and uh, and uh, they're both managed well um, taking a, a step back then what are some of the larger implications that uh, you've mentioned some of the details in these budgets uh, what is uh, are some of the larger implications for Ohio's workers and businesses well the biggest implication the biggest uh, uh, function obviously is to it, it is there to support injured workers, to recover from the injuries so they can get back to work as soon as possible and, and be productive. And of course, as you well know, the, the uh, administration since day one, the Kasich administration and, and the General Assembly has focused, the primary focus is job creation. And all this plays together. I mean, when people are working and ac accidents happen, I mean, there is a risk to living. <laughs> It's real basic, and so uh, uh, you know there's accidents on the job, and and so when that happens, you, you get well and go back to work, and and that keeps people in the workforce. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, larger main state operating budget um, that is still going through the house. So it's important to note that nothing is final quite yet. Uh, haven't seen a, a final version quite yet. Um, before we get into that, can you give uh, the viewers at home? sort of a, a timeline or a look at what the budget process is like, it's just so they have a sense of proportion of how, how long it is and, and what goes into it. Sure. Well, of course, Brad, the first year of the biennium in February, the governor presents his budget aspirations for the next two years, next biennium, to the House. The, the budget always starts in the House of Representatives. And that legislation is given a number just like any other bill, and it then goes through the committee process. The chairman of the committee uh, has several subcommittees uh, that, that deal with various aspects, various subjects of the budget. And they will deliberate that and discuss and modify, amend, and so on. And, and from about mid-February until uh, late April, later this month, the budget will probably pass the House and then go to the Senate where it will go through the same process. The, the Senate uh, chairman of the Finance Committee will go through the, the House passed version of the budget and, and they'll make changes to it and, and then it'll c come back uh, to the House for concurrence and uh, I have n this is my 12th budget uh, since I've been in, in the State House in, in the House of Representatives and no budget has ever passed both houses without going to a conference committee to iron out the differences. And the same thing will happen this time as well. So that's basic, and, and the time frame is we, we have to have everything done and wrapped up by the end of the biennium, which is June the 30th. If we don't have a budget in place to start July 1st, then, then you have to uh, go back to the drawing boards. And, and at that point, uh, let's say the budget is not finalized by June the 30th, at that point we would have to, the General Assembly would have to pass a, a, an interim budget, and usually that's done in 30-day th in segments. But, but my, my hope is, and my guess is, that uh, come June 30th we'll, ha we'll have a budget in place for the next biennium. So nothing is set in stone quite yet, but no. um, 
generally, what are some of the things you expect to see in a, a House passed, passed version of the budget that might be similar and some things that might be different from the governor's plan? Well, of course, the governor came in with a lot of tax proposals, some uh, decreases. Of course, he, the, the focus by the governor and the administration is to reduce the personal income tax to the point where eventually we phase it out to zero, and I support that. Uh, but in this particular budget, there's lots of other tax proposals that are in there that are designed to have revenues de available while we're decreasing the income tax so that in some in many cases you'll have increase in taxes uh, if his proposal went through the way it was presented uh, there would be increases in sales taxes and cat and and other taxes and so on and then and and uh, uh, there'd be a reduction in the personal income tax. So if cigarette taxes go up, he wants to increase in severance taxes. I mean, there's just a, a whole package of taxes that would be increased while the personal income tax is being decreased. So that's creating a lot of discussion and, and so on. So that's, that's, that's an interesting play right now. <laughs> uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, we'll close with a topic that is not uh, related to the budget and taxes. Um, for the second consecutive General Assembly, you have uh, joint sponsored a bill with uh, Democrat Ron Gerberry mm -hmm. to uh, ban the sale of what is known as powdered alcohol in the state of Ohio. Um, and we've talked about this on a previous episode. Um, but can you again share with uh, the viewers what exactly powdered alcohol is and the concerns that you have with it? Well, it, it obviously is a, a process that was invented to crystal, make crystal, crystals out of alcohol, and just like uh, uh, powdered uh, coffee and, and other, uh, you know, tang, other powdered drinks. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the palcohol, it's called, is uh, in one ounce packets. And uh, you, the idea is to take one ounce of the palcohol and mix it with eight ounces of water, and then you have an alcoholic drink. And it's uh, 55 proof, uh, which points to it ends up being about 10 percent volume of alcohol uh, in an eight ounce drink. Now, just as comparison, that would be about twice the amount of alcohol as in a, a, a can of light beer. So in other words, it's, it's real simple. It's a two to one ratio. In other words, a, a glass of alcoholic uh, alcohol in a glass of water has the same alcohol content as two beers. Now here, here's the thing that starts, where it starts to get dicey is because, uh, it, you know, if you take one ounce of alcohol, one packet, and put it with eight ounces of water, that makes a nice alcoholic drink. But if you want a stronger drink, you put two, three, four in. So all of a sudden, if you got f four packets of, of alcohol and eight ounces of water, that makes a nice strong drink. But it's also the equivalent of eight beers. So it gets to be pretty strong. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, it, it's, uh, it, without c any kind of control, it'll be uh, regulated or it would be dispensed, could be dispensed in, in C stores, uh, in all kinds of uh, groceries, uh, you know, every place. Uh, and, and all this is is just more options for people to get in trouble with given the alcohol and drug problems that we have. And certainly uh, uh, young people uh, could get into alcohol pretty quickly and uh, it's just uh, not a good situation from from representative Gerberry in my standpoint so that's why we're pushing and, and of course the real problem is from our perspective in, in in dealing with House Bill 14 is the fact that the federal government just okayed it nationwide so you're gonna nationwide this product's going to be available for sale and I'm sure through distribution channels by by June or summertime it's going to be available all over the country so we're trying to preempt it by by uh, banning it in Ohio. Um, we probably have touched on this. It's a very short, straightforward bill, um, but uh, you've talked about the, the goal of House Bill 14. Have we pretty much covered it? I think we have uh, at this point. It's passed the House. It passed the House unanimously. Uh, uh, deliberations are going on in the Senate. As you know, it's a, uh, there's, it's a bicameral approach, and uh, the bill is not finalized yet, and uh, there could be some changes made to it. So. Uh, we'll just kind of hide and watch and see how it plays out. But in the long run, I'm hopeful that since the, it's, this product has been approved nationwide by the alcohol and t uh, tobacco folks in Washington, that, uh, it, that when this bill is, becomes law, I'm confident it's going to become law because of the necessity of the situation and the Fed's approving it, that uh, it will be, 
it, w it will be an outright ban at best, and if not, then I hope well, it, it's going to be strongly regulated or, or handled somehow so that we, we can reduce the problems and the mayhem. We have about a minute left. You know the drill. Share with your uh, sure constituents do. in the 84th district how they can reach you here in Columbus. Well, 614-466-6344 by phone, rep84 at ohiohouse.gov or tinyurl.com slash beaky april 2015 to take the survey our monthly survey and we appreciate everybody who views this show taking the time to fill out our surveys and send them back because all of this form of com communication is very helpful to me as i make decisions that affect the the good people of the 84th house district and that information again is uh, uh also on the screen representative as always uh, great to talk to you uh, thanks for having me brad again and we look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Ohio in Focus, the program that brings state government to you. Thanks for watching.